Hi class and welcome to this video on transport across cell membranes. So we just finished up our really exciting unit on cells and we learned all about cell structure and function. But one of the things we didn't really look at was how is that cell membrane made and how does it function? And so we're sort of transitioning into our next unit on energy. And the next unit on energy talks about how a cell is going to take in nutrients from the environment and turn it into energy so that it can do its job and it can do all that wonderful work. So let's learn now this week about how those nutrients actually get across that cell membrane so that the cell can turn it into energy. So that's our key question. How do essential nutrients enter cells and then how does waste leave? Because your cell is constantly also making cellular waste. So first let's take a look at the picture of the, the cell membrane and what's on the inside and what's on the outside of the cell. So here is our phospholipid bilayer. This is our plasma membrane. This is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell. Okay, The inside of the, inside of the cell has something called a cytoskeleton. This simply provides internal support um, and it's also sort of like a transport system so that proteins and vesicles can get to where they need to go. So that's the cytoskeleton inside. Outside of the cell, we have something called the extracellular matrix, and this provides for external support, and it also provides a mechanism for cells to communicate with one another by sort of just uh, touching with the extracellular matrix. So we have to think about how do nutrients from out here get inside the cell, and that's what we're going to look at right now. <clears throat> so collagen provides external support, and surface carbohydrates provide for communication, and that's the cell membrane. So cell membrane, I like to call it the gatekeeper uh, because it's selectively permeable. It's only going to allow certain things to pass directly through and other things are going to need some help. So here is the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, let's take a closer look. We're going to zoom in on it here. And remember from the macromolecule video, this is a fat. It has a hydrophilic phosphate head, and it has two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. And it's a bilayer, so it's got two layers, one layer on top and one layer on bottom. So polar phosphate head, nonpolar fatty acid tail. So it is the gatekeeper. It's going to allow certain things to pass right through. Um, however, some molecules need a protein channel to cross. So let's take a closer look at this selective permeability. It allows certain molecules to pass directly through based on chemical properties. So some things that can pass directly through are small molecules like oxygen gas and carbon dioxide. Because they're small, they can diffuse right across the phospholipid bilayer. Some things like Big molecules or polar molecules like water, they need a protein channel. They cannot simply pass directly across the membrane. Um, so we have to look at how that actually happens. So first we'll look at that first example of oxygen and carbon dioxide. They pass through the membrane through a process called diffusion. It's also called passive transport because it requires no input of energy. So let's see how that works. Here we've got maybe oxygen particles in a highly concentrated. They're going to want to move from high to low. That's called moving down their concentration gradient. And it happens spontaneously without energy at all, going from high to low. And then at the end, you have equilibrium. So diffusion from high to low, this is called moving down its concentration gradient. No energy required. And again, small molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide can diffuse from high to low through the cell membrane. You experience diffusion every day. I'm trying to get you to connect to real life here. Can you think of an example where you experience, don't think about chemistry or biology, just every day that you experience a something moving from high to low concentration? Where do you see that? Put that in your notes for me. Okay, facilitated diffusion is another type of passive transport. It does not require energy. We're still moving from high to low. But this is when polar molecules or large molecules like glucose or water need some help. And they get that help from proteins in the membrane. So those proteins act as channels. So let's see what that looks like. Just a reminder, diffusion, it's still passive. Facilitate just means to help. So down here in this figure here in green, we have these protein channels that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. Outside, we have large molecules or charged molecules like glucose or sodium, 
that need to get inside. But because they're large or because they're polar, they can't pass through this hydrophobic lipid bilayer. So they need a hydrophilic channel, a polar channel that they can pass through to get inside of the cell. They're still going from high to low, it's still diffusion, they just need that membrane protein channel helper. Okay, what happens in a cell or if the cell's environment changes? How does the cell membrane continue to maintain homeostasis? Homeostasis is simply a cell's happy set point. This means that there's a good concentration of both water and solutes inside the cell and outside the cell. But you know what? The cell has to work to maintain this. The cell is always moving solutes and water across the membrane to maintain that homeostasis. So if the external environment becomes too full of solute or too full of water, the cell must somehow regulate that and maintain homeostasis. And how does it do it? It does it through a process called osmosis. Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water across a membrane in response to solute concentration. So if the cell recognizes that some sort of solute concentration has changed, it's going to move water in response to that. Water always follows solute. Keep that in mind as we look at some examples of this. So here's our example. This is called a U-tube because it's in the shape of a U. Here is our semi-permeable membrane separating the two sides. In gray, we have water. In red, we have some sort of solute. Notice on the left side, we've got a lot of solute. On the right side, not a lot of solute, but we have a lot of water. Try to answer this question. Which way will the water move? Remember, water follows solute. Remember that water is diffusing down its own concentration gradient. So water is going to go from high to low, and hopefully you answered that it's going to move that way. And so water is going to move from high water to low water, or it'll just follow the solute because it wants to even out all that solute. And so the final state is going to have the left side have more water in it because that's the direction the water moved. Let's take a look at how this actually works in animal cells, and then we'll look at plant cells. So in an isotonic environment, you don't have to worry too much about these names. This just simply means that the solute concentration inside and outside is the same. So there's no net water movement. Water is still moving back and forth, but just not in any particular direction. In a hypertonic environment, there's a lot of solute out here. Okay, I think of it hyper high solute. So water follows solute, right? Water is going to leave the cell, and that's not good. That animal cell is going to shrivel up. In a hypotonic environment, the environment has hardly any solute. It has low solute, hypo, low solute. So water is going to want to follow solute inside of the cell. There's too much solute inside the cell, and the cell is going to burst. See the cell bursting here. We call it lysine, L-Y-S-E. In a plant cell, the situation is a little bit different. Okay, so in an isotonic environment, there's no net water movement. Um, but you know what? The plant cell doesn't really like this. It's not happy like this. We call this being flaccid. So if you left celery out on the counter overnight, that would be limp or flaccid. But animal cells actually like to be isotonic. They're happy there. Maybe a plant cell's happy in a hypertonic environment. Lots of solute outside of the cell, but water leaves the cell and this is not good. This is called being plasmalized. The plasma membrane is actually pulling away from the cell wall, and that's not good either. What about a hypotonic environment? Not a lot of solute outside, so water is going to enter the cell, follow solute inside, and this is actually good. The plant cell likes to be in a hypotonic environment because it likes to be turgid. It's central vacuole full of water. So that's how the cell maintains homeostasis by moving water down its concentration gradient. That is called osmosis. Now another type of transport is active transport. And this requires energy because you're moving molecules against their gradient. Not from high to low, but now we're moving them from low to high. So this requires this ATP energy molecule. That's the high energy molecule of the cell. And again, just like with facilitated diffusion, membrane proteins are necessary to do this. So here we have something that's in low concentration outside the cell, and it needs to get inside, but it's going to go from low to high. So it needs ATP energy to do that. So ATP activates this protein to open it up, and then it brings in these solutes inside of the cell. So that's active transport. 
And let's just do a quick summary. So diffusion from high to low, uh, simple small molecules can do that like oxygen. Facilitated diffusion, large molecules and polar molecules need some protein help, and then active transport to go from low to high concentration. One last type of transport is called bulk transport. This is when some items are just really way too big to either go through the lipid bilayer on their own or even through protein. So we have two types. Exocytosis, exo simply means without, so this is when the cell needs to secrete large macromolecules out of the cell, so they have internal vesicles that fuse with the plasma membrane to secrete those large particles. Endocytosis, this means within, so the cell is eating, the cell is taking in macromolecules through these vesicles. Let's look at a picture of this. So exocytosis, here's some waste that we need to get rid of. So we're going to make a vesicle that is actually just going to fuse with the existing plasma membrane and then secrete that waste outside. Endocytosis is the opposite. We've got some large molecules to bring in. So we're actually just going to pinch in that cell membrane and form an internal vesicle. And that does it uh, for this video on transport.